I guess we can get started now. Uh, it's about 1.30. And uh, welcome to Robert E. Howard Days, uh, first of all. Uh, uh, this is our second panel, but the first one here at the church. So, uh, again, thanks to the First United Methodist Church. And, and thanks to Fred for all the, the great electronics. Appreciate it, Fred. Um, this panel is called The Writers of REH. And when we set this one up, uh, uh, we, we have four distinguished gentlemen here uh, <laughs> who uh, uh, have all written about Robert E. Howard, but they've all written about Howard from different perspectives, literary, uh, physical, uh, where he's been, uh, emotional. Uh, so uh, we're, what we're going to do is I'm just going to turn it over to them and let them talk about uh, uh, their approach to writing about Robert E. Howard. Uh, on the far left, we have Rob Ream, who has done many books. Rob has uh, taken it upon, it upon himself to travel where Howard has traveled. And uh, he's put in many miles and, and much heartache about, uh, about finding out where, where Robert E. Howard been, has been. <clears throat> and next is uh, David C. Smith, the guest of honor here at uh, Howard Days 2019. Uh, his most recent entry, or his, his entry into writing about Robert E. Howard is Robert E. Howard, a literary biography. And uh, there's copies available, so I'd say get it and buy it and, and read it, because it's really good. Uh, and Mr. Patrice Lunet, uh, he's written a couple of words about Howard. <laughs> Maybe just a couple. And Mr. Bobby Deary, who uh, is the probably the most uh, proficient blogger about Robert E. Howard, among other things. He publishes books too. Uh, I'm just going to let him uh, let him go, and uh, I think we'll turn it over to in the honor of our guest of honor. We'll let uh, we'll let Dave start off and just yak about Howard. When I start talking, it's hard to stop. So you got to the the approach that that I took with the literary biography. I should probably say, can you hear me? Is this, is this working? How's that? Okay, good. I want to make sure. Um, it was not my idea to write the biography, believe it or not. Um, is it okay? Yeah. It, it wasn't my idea actually to write uh, to write the biography. I was approached by by the publisher Bob McLean, who um, operates uh, Pulp Hero Press. He also operates Theme Park Press. He's been a publisher for a long time. He's in Manhattan. And he had approached me about the possibility of reprinting some of the earlier Sword and Sorcery books I'd written. Um, we didn't get the rights to those, but in the meantime, he was looking for someone. He's, he's really building up his catalog of good uh, um, Sword and Sorcery fiction and fantasy fiction and pulp fiction. Um, so he wondered if, if I knew anyone who might want to write a, a good general introductory biography to Robert E. Howard. Uh, more for a general reader is, is what he wanted. So I mentioned a couple of names that I knew, and um, for various reasons that already had their say on Howard, or they were, you know, busy with other, with other projects. So he asked me if I wanted to, and I I realized I've, I've been a Howard fan since junior high school, and there's a lot of thoughts that I had and uh, ideas about Howard and his fiction. I thought I I could use this as a vehicle to express those. So. Um, what I told Bob was that I'd like to look at it from the perspective of a writer looking over the shoulder of another writer. I've been an editor, I've written fiction, I, I've been a typesetter, I've, you know, I've written advertising copy, anything that had to do with words, I've done it. And I spent a lot of time in the commercial publishing field and dealing with editors. So is it okay if I take that, that perspective, plus I get to put them in the context of America in the jazz age of the 1930s? which is rich with, with um, history and, and popular culture ideas, you know, by itself. So as I started thinking about this, he, he, he liked that idea. It wound up being a little more uh, scholarly, I think, than either one of us anticipated, which is not a bad thing at all, um, but it ended up that being the perspective that I took. And so I relied upon experts, you know, who were in print that I, that I could ask for help. Um, but once we got past the, the basic grounding of, of his life, you know, being born and, and moving across planes with his family, that's when I stepped in as, as an author and editor, 
uh, and started to present it from that perspective. Here's what it feels like from the inside out, um, as well as I could, to pick up a copy of a magazine and you open it up and you say, how, how do I get from here to being in that magazine? How, how do I get to be a writer? How do I take those steps? What do I do? And so that's the approach that I tried to take. Um, and I followed them year by year, manuscript by manuscript, story by story. And a lot of interesting things came out from, from doing it that way. So um, that's, that's my start of me talking. Um, Rob, would you like to, to pick it up? I am the least talkative person in the bunch, <laughs> Super quick. Reading biographies about Howard before 2006, mm. there were a lot of ideas out there that I didn't, that didn't make sense to me. Uh, Texas is a big state. It's, almost, it's as big as Paris. No, it's as big as France, excuse me. So it's bigger. It's, it's, it's <laughs> almost as big as Patrice's head. <laughs> uh, but a lot, there was this idea out there that Howard never traveled and mm -hmm. that he just had lived his whole life in cross planes. And there were a few mysteries uh, in what I was reading too. Uh, Howard talks about living in the Wichita Falls country, and no mm -hmm. one had found evidence of where that might have been. There were just little things like that that bugged me, and I always want to know how we know what we know. So when someone says something about Howard that they say is a fact, I'm like, where did that come from? How do you know that? And that sent me, and usually with my, my dad, and sometimes with my mom as well, just all over the state of Texas. I don't know how many courthouses I've been to, digging up land records, court documents on not only Robert E. Howard and his dad, but their family, their family's family. I have quite an extensive genealogy. Uh, other than those things, I also like to just compile source material and package it for people who are nuts like me. So I put together a book of Herbert Klatt writings. Herbert Klatt was a friend of Howard's. I have pulled relevant newspaper articles from Cross Plains Review, Brownwood Bulletin, all the high school and college publications, and packaged that all together with some little chapter introductions by myself into a, a book called Post Oak Lake. School Days in the Post Oaks. My perspective is just, how do we know what we know, and let's give that to the public. Hmm. That's, that's the, my primary focus. Patrice. I don't even know where to begin. I've written know, how many articles and books this is about Bob Howard. Um, I guess that if I had to sum up what I'm doing is, where are we today, and what do I want to do with the stuff I'm writing? So it, it means I'm writing for different audiences, so I have to know who I'm writing for. Uh, for example, when I did the, the, the Robert Howard Guide, this came out first in France in 2015. And the book uh, came out because I had been repeatedly asked the same questions over and over and over again. And so I had been interviewed, I don't know how many times, and I kept repeating the same thing. So one day I decided, okay, I need to write a book about that. It's going to be short, it's going to be to the point, it's going to be cheap. That was the whole point of it. So that when people started asking me questions again, I said, read that book. And if someone has a friend who is a hard fan or a Conan fan or whatever, buy the book, it's cheap. And so that was the, reason, the reasoning the, uh, behind the, this book, this short book. And I think it's um, at the point where we are in hard studies in the States, and France and the States are different in that respect. In France, um, Howard is on the verge of becoming respectable. He's a huge figure now. And I think it's because you, I've spent 15 years doing the same things over and over and over again. So uh, when I was writing the guide, I was writing for people who were mostly interested in the Conan board game, the Solomon Kane board game, uh, related products, but not necessarily uh, the, the, the stories. So I wanted those people to discover more about Howard and then from that, go and read the stories. Of course, it was an entirely different approach when I did the, the essays at the end of the Dead Ray Conan books, for example. Uh, the aim behind that is what, oh, you have been reading those stories and thinking that the stories came from William Morris or whatever, uh, what DeCamp and Carter were saying at the time, and I felt it was not the right approach. I wanted the, the readers to get you know, some material, some source material about the stories, and then from that, 
it can go beyond if you're interested in knowing more about the guy. So it's, I'm always writing with an audience in mind. I always have an objective, depending on the public. At the moment, I'm completing a PhD on a PhD dissertation on Howard at La Sorbonne. And of course, the writing is totally different because I'm not you know, uh, writing this for people who are into board games. They wouldn't be interested at all. And so, <clears throat> and of course, the writing is entirely different, but I guess it's evident. And then, Bobby? <laughs> My perspective writing about Robert E. Howard is how does he connect with the other writers and the rest of his context? In the United States, in the 1920s and 1930s, he was part of something. He was part of a movement of people during the Great Depression, during Prohibition, that were living by their wits, really. They were living to write. And they were interacting, they were having fun, they were corresponding. The most famous one is, of course, the correspondence between Robert e. Howard and H.P. Lovecraft, but he talked to a lot of different people in the pulp circle, and they just had interactions. Seabury Quinn, C.L. Moore, Clark Ashton Smith, these are all people that today are, well, maybe not as famous as they should be for their material, but because of the hard work by Patrice and Rob and Rusty Burke and others to get the original Howard material out there, his correspondence, his stories, we can go back and look and find the connections and tell their stories, and Robert E. Howard is an essential part of that. And that's very interesting to me just from the perspective of treating his material as more than just fiction, it's a historical source. Do we have any? Thanks for coming. <laughs> <laughs> any questions? Drive safely. <laughs> Culturally, back <laughs> also the correspondence between the different writers. You know, we have email now. Was it just something they did? They would write letters back and forth and then save them? Uh, no, actually. Um, H.P. Lovecraft is the most famous letter writer in that circle because he wrote a massive amount of mail. He wrote somewhere between 80 to 100,000 pieces of correspondence during his lifetime, which ran from everything from a little note on a postcard to a 100-page letter. Yeah. And if you read A Means to Freedom, the collected correspondence of H.P. Lovecraft and Robert e. Howard, they were regularly sending each other 20, 30-page letters. Yeah. But this was very unusual. Uh, most of the correspondence between writers has not survived, and what has survived is usually what you would have today or yesterday in email. You know, it's a page or two of text at most. This was stuff that was being sent through the mail. They might expect an answer in a week or a month, but uh, when they were really at it, you know, when they were really going at it, they'd be sending letters to each other every three days. It's really fun and exciting, but it's no, it's not usual at all. It was actually very unusual to have all these pulp writers that were really sharing ideas with each other and corresponding, and it didn't always last for all of them. Uh, Clark Ashton Smith sent maybe 10 or 12 letters, and it just dropped off. He got too busy with his parents. Robert Howard was busy writing, and you know the correspondence didn't last. They didn't say both sides of it, but what we have was saved because they valued that correspondence. Anybody else? Questions? Comments? So what, what, the more you learn about Howard as a person, do you like him more or less? <laughs> That's well, a, hey, wait, up for me. I don't, I, I'll take it. <laughs> I, if, if I could take the question first, um, in the research that I did, I like him more than I ever did, and I appreciate his art more, more than ever. Um, all of us here, I think I can safely say grew up with this impression of Howard as being wackadoodle. And that, that was kind of engineered, if I may. Um, but we grew up with the idea that, that he was kind of nutsoid. And my thought was, if he was that crazy, how did he even manage to sit down and type a story, let alone become a great writer? You know. Um, but as I said, I've been reading him since junior high school. Um, and there's, there's some magic spark there in, in his stuff. And as the years went by, and I became a writer myself, and I edited works of other, of other people, fiction and nonfiction, some of the science material, uh, this broad general background, um, when I got the contract for the book, I just I started 
you know, pursuing what he was doing, you know, story by story, uh, year by year, and it was a revelation. Because at least from my perspective, and not just mine, I, I feel if, if others would do this as well, you can kind of see the gears turning. And everything that was supposed to make him be a weirdo or something was inspiration. He, w he, he was a brilliant poet. He had insights into things that most of us, you know, it won't occur to us. And he built this, this engine of creativity and insight and philosophy inside himself, and you can see that taking shape in, in his stories as he writes them. And then on top of that, he was, he was trying to, to manage this so that it would become commercially respectable or at least, you know, acceptable. Um, and he was so unique a person, it's kind of remarkable that he managed to do that. But as I went through these stories and some of the correspondence, um, the, the guy came alive to me more than ever, and um, he was an incredibly unique, brilliant artist. And as I worked on my book, I hope some of that comes through, and I hope as we pursue more of his studies, that will come through to the general public, because he's a major figure in American letters of the 20th century. He just is. And we're a generation two behind promoting that vision of him, but we'll catch up, because he's the real deal. So. I think the less we rely on what used to be the standard biography, mm -hmm. the more we're going to see how it has, if not likable, at least just merely troubled, perhaps, mm. not, not wackadoodle. <laughs> uh, growing up, I only had De Camp's introductions in right. the Conan books right. to kind of form what I thought of him as a writer. But I was a pretty young kid when I read those, mm -hmm. and I didn't come to fandom until I was in my 30s, which was, you know, Two yesterday, <laughs> um, yesterday, and I didn't read Dark Valley Destiny until after I had read Tavis Clyde Smith's writings and Madeline mm -hmm. Price's writings and That's Rusty good. Burke, and yeah. so I had a a different idea about Howard than a lot of the other guys that were my age that had been in fandom for a mm -hmm. lot longer. So I think it, that a lot of that's falling away now that we have other biographies and other voices. So yeah, Howard's not so wackadoodle. Right. Uh, I would add something. I would. Um, I think I like Hart as a writer. I think he was a genius. But I don't think we know the guy, the, the man, uh, through his letters. Uh, we, what we get to know through the letters is how as he projected himself on those letters. And it's not the same person. I mean, I don't know who he was. I don't even know if anyone here can say that he, he, we can know if he, who he was, the kind of person he was. Uh, what we have is projection. So it's not the same thing, really. Hmm. It's interesting because it there's a core in a writer. I was I'm not disagreeing. There's a core in a writer, and then as as different, you know, you're 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 portraying different characters. You have different ideas, and then that comes through, and all all of these together. But your yeah, your but point's if, well if, taken. If you read yeah. if you read the, you know, the the Lovecraft letters, for example, if mm -hmm, you take mm -hmm. anything in that face value, you're going to be in for a major right. disillusionment because he was inventing things and. In inflating them or sometimes merely reporting. So it takes you know, a detective to know what's true, what's not true, what's exaggerated or not. And so it's a whole different journey. Mark, Mark talks about in his book that tradition of storytelling and larger than life stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mark Finn in his book, um, Blood, and Thunder. Blood and Thunder. Blood and yeah. Thunder, yeah. Ex excellent biography. Yeah. We'll take questions over there. Uh, Derek? I forget where Red was. Howard tried to learn Irish Gaelic at some point and called himself the Far Dawn. Do you know much about that? How did he go about doing that? Old Irish diction. Uh, the uh, O'Reilly, forget the name, the dictionary. Which one was that? Do you know that one? O'Reilly. Oh, the the yeah, O'Reilly. It's online. I don't, know. I don't know that one. No, you have it. Right? You have me. I don't know. I think it is. Yeah, it's O'Reilly's. It's O'Reilly's, yeah. Okay. Irish. Early, early 19th century. Okay. It's online. If you want to have fun with that, you could do that. <laughs> you had a question? Well, a question for David and actually all of you. Sure. David, you just sort of dropped something. Oh. You, you, you said uh, that this image we have mm -hmm. of Thomas being wacky mm -hmm. was your word manufactured. Yes. Uh, it was could it. you expand It was engineered, and it's a play on words. That, yeah, it was engineered. And, um, well, could you expand on that? Yeah, it's because Sprague de Camp was an engineer. Why on earth would somebody want to do that? Well, that's a good question. That's a very, very good question. Um, and th these gentlemen know more about the facts behind it than I do, but, but if you go back and read the Lancer um, books and so on, um, 
it it was it was done. Am I correct in saying it was done so that so that Sprague, we can say his name, right? Oh, you yeah, know, sure. got in there so that he could be I don't like saying his name. Um, but no, the the idea was was um, to present Howard in such a way that he was subordinate, I would say, to the vision that Sprague de Camp had for promoting the Conan stories. Sprague didn't care about the westerns and he didn't care about the boxing stories but he had made it his job in the 50s to promote the Conan stories um, as a cash cow and um, if I'm incorrect on any of these details please correct me but I'm pretty sure that's generally the way that it goes and he succeeded because um, for instance where I used to work in Chicago I'm retired now but um, Dave, the guy who was a security guard, it was, we were talking one day, oh, you write books and so on. I said, yeah, I do. Did you ever read Conan? Those are some of the best novels ever. And we soon discovered, what, what are you talking about? And he was talking about that series in the 90s where Sprague edited, was the general editor, and he had hired other writers like Robert Jordan and, and a number of people um, to write Conan novels based on Sprague's manufactured uh, chronology of, of Conan's lifetime. Um, Howard never did anything like that at all. He was talking about an, an old timer sitting around the campfire talking about when he fought, you know, the Aquilonians or whatever, you know, and he was just an old timer from the frontier. Um, Sprague manu manufactured that. Um, when I told Dave to change the security guard, it's like, oh, that's not Conan. You need to read <laughs> the short story. I bought, I bought your book, so I gave it to him. And it was a revelation. He's like, holy cow, this, this stuff is great. The other books aren't the same. No, they're not the same. So that's what I mean by that, is it was kind of a, a, you know, rear pass or something, you know, rear guard action. And we're only now coming out of that, that period. Am I right about yeah, that? Sure. Yeah, sure. Yeah. And this ties in with the subject of the, the other panel, because when you write something about Howard, your, your reader, 90% of the time, is someone who's going to be familiar with Conan the Barbarian, you know, right. the iconic image, not right. Conan the Cimmerian, not even, you know, for the comic books. Right. So you have to... To have to keep that in mind because you're writing for a very specific audience, and so you have to educate them along the way, and it's just a long process. You want to say something? Oh, I'm a spray. Okay. Okay. Oh, you're the spray the can. Okay. He's pro. But I'm not sure what you're saying about the manufacturing engineer. Right. It was a great success. It and, was. And, and the current holders, the cabinet holdings, are following that path. They mm -hmm. got past coming out. You know, the comic books, crossover mm -hmm. with the Avengers. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even, you know, when you say it was manufactured, it was a beautiful manufacturing uh, Oh, go this. ahead, please. Okay. Yeah. So I just want to, you know, just, you know, I'm just... Oh, no, let's, let's, point, let's talk about it. Sure. Uh, to yeah. the point where, you know, I just, you know, I don't want... Uh, it's true, they're different things. The product is great. The, the effect on the author was not so much. Oh, there you go. That's a good way of putting it, too. Yeah. One was negative or not. It's just a different thing. Uh, let me talk about that one for half a minute. Okay, there is a important difference between the author and the product. And when we talk about Conan, we don't usually think about him in the same sense as Lovecraft and the Cthulhu Mythos. But there's a lot of people mm -hmm. that have contributed to the Cthulhu Mythos, and their work does not necessarily reflect on Lovecraft. And there are a lot of people that have written some great stuff about Conan. If you've ever read the Marvel or the Dark Horse comics, people like Roy Thomas and Kurt Busiek have done some great things with mm -hmm. Conan mm -hmm. as a character. But that isn't what Robert E. Howard wrote. And what a large part of what I think gets people's goat about the early stuff that Elspray DeCamp edited and especially co-wrote and authored is that you couldn't tell very often where exactly mm. the Howard stopped. The camp inserted himself a little too much into the whole process. And if you read the camp's biography of H.P. Lovecraft and you compare it with the biography he did with uh, Griffith and his wife on Robert E. Howard, Dark Valley Destiny, there's a lot of the same things in the same place. And you start to wonder, all right, is mm. it really that these guys both had an Oedipus complex, or maybe mm. was DeCamp putting a little too much of his own impression mm. in there? And that's really where you need to get the dividing line down. All authors are going to have their own biases to the material. You know, each of us has a slightly different impression of who Robert E. Howard was and what we know about him and how. But 
as long as we know that there is our own bias, we can take ourselves out of it to a degree. You know, we can say, all right, Robbie Howard wrote this, and this is my take on it. De Camp didn't always mm -hmm. have that mm -hmm. objectivity. Yeah. And that's really sort of where I think we fell down on him. Is uh, It's really hard to take De Camp out of Howard, but that's what happened. That's how it happened. Put it, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hate to agree with Gary on anything, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, so don't get any bigger head. <laughs> but I do want to say that Sprague, we had long minutes with Sprague okay, yeah. before they passed away. And about the issue you're talking mm -hmm. about here and the conflict and all that. And every time we visited with him, the last thing he would say is, and I think you, I think you meant it, I didn't think you just saying this for effect. He, he would talk about how important Robert Howard was to him. Hmm. But then he'd also talk about that there was never any of the pastiches that were written that came anywhere close to Howard. He really said that? He said that. Okay, he that yeah. He's often. Now, he, that could have been manufactured to the point that, you know, he felt like he had to say it. Well, but he did say it. He, he did say it, he did write it too. Uh, I'm going to quote an interview he did for Lone Star Fictioneer way back in the 70s. He said, no, none of the stories we have written are as good as ours because we're not as crazy he was. Oh, he did, that, yeah, he did say he that. Did. So, yeah, but, that's a compliment. <laughs> but he, but, but, <laughs> but Jack, he, he, he was sincerely, he did sincerely <laughs> appreciate what Howard was doing on some level, is what you're saying. Oh, there's no doubt about it. Okay. That. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt about it. Okay. That's that's interesting, yeah. And, uh, I, I, I took it a bit. I don't think he was going to smoke at him because okay. he had no reason at that stage in his life to do that. Okay. For what it's worth. But I, I no, agree with everything that's been said, too, that the shaping he did has shaped it, and a lot of people don't know the difference in it and everything. But as far as uh, the interaction we had, it was professional. Mm -hmm. He helped us in every way he could. He educated us in every way he could. And not any of it had to do with be little Robert Howard. Be, be, okay, yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, and we didn't get into the, the stuff that you talked about on our belly destiny, you know. The okay. That we, we challenged him on any of that stuff. I, with all of y'all, I have a different opinion just from going up here. Sure. I don't think he's crazy. I think everybody I grew up with is crazy. There you go. Welcome to Texas. It's just a part of small town Texas. Yeah, and every yeah. One of Well, yeah, yeah. I, I was talking earlier. I'm trying to think who I was talking to. I think it was Jim Barron. But if if you were a, a like me when I was growing up, you know, a, a skinny little kid with glasses, you'd like to read Conan and science fiction and stuff. You you were an outlier. You know, you were picked on. You know, and and because you're just not part of that mainstream. So if that's the point you're making, I can see that. Um, is it particular? Is it peculiar to, to small Texas towns? I mean, I'm from Ohio, so. Is it just being like like the the odd duck or the kid who's a little bit smarter or? I mean, what what's your, what are your images of Texas? I like Texas. <laughs> Cowboys, and and sure, yeah, um, yeah. It, Courthouse it's, burning down. It's part of the expectation. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I don't know any of you that was down in the. Uh, and I'll shut up after this. No. <laughs> <laughs> down, down at the fish fry Thursday night, and a young man walked in and he had a gun on his belt. Mm. And he's a good friend, family, very good friend, mm -hmm. very active in this church. And I walked in, I thought he had, he had security. He's in the service now, and, he's, and I thought he'd been gone into the military side, mm -hmm. you know, in, in the service. And he wasn't. He said, I have a per permit. Permit for, yeah. And I pulled out and he showed it to me. Yeah. That's just Texas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I can add just to that. Just Real quick, it's not just small Texas towns. I'm from Frisco. There you go. And it's like 180,000 people. Yeah. And like you said, if you're this skinny kid who reads yep. science fiction 
you're an outlier. Yep. I ran track and I was in sports, but I was also Yep. I also did this. I read Robert E. Howard. I played Dungeons and Dragons. So if See. you're part of that circle, you're an outlier, no matter what you do. So I think that might just be a that might just be a Texas thing. Like yeah. I said, you know, cowboy boots, cowboy hats. Yeah, <laughs> sure. My dad, he's a big hunter. Yeah. And he My dad too. He yeah. us. He See there? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's just kind of the expectation. I, I found an article online that I, that I referenced in, in the back of the book. I have some little essays, some of the footnotes. And it was called, um, how this guy? I found it online, it was a couple of years old, but, but in, intellectuals are freaks. Mm -hmm. And, and the, the writer's point is that statistically, people who love books or science fiction or into the arts or something, we're, we're like maybe 10%, maybe smaller percentage of just general society. And that's just how it is. It's not right or wrong. It's, it's just it is what it is, you know. Um, but those of us who are a little bit out, outside that mainstream or whatever, we have to learn to negotiate that. And we're the ones that come up with, you know, Conan the Barbarian and Leonardo da Vinci and great music and all the arts. We're the ones that contribute that. But apparently the only way we're able to do that is, is by being, you know, a little bit different, you know, just looking at things a little differently than the mainstream, which is, is how life is. So that's fine. But you can see where where Howard would have, you know, was one of the, and Novelin too, I think, and, and, and Clyde Smith and, and them, you know, so. Way in the back. Yes, uh, it seems like with Robert E. Howard, especially compared to a lot of other authors, that Howard scholars really focus more on the man than the content of his works. Do, do you agree with that premise? No. Nope. Uh, read, read Patrice's essay. No, I'm, I'm <laughs> he said no. He does not. I would argue that there is some of that only because the writer has been obscured for so long. Hmm. Uh, uh, no offense, Gary. <laughs> we just haven't had all the facts of his biography available to us. Hmm. Um, why, it's, are, why are they so important? Why are they more important than... Uh, you can do a reading of a story or a novel without any biographical information. It's not required. But you can also do a, uh, reading, taking the author's life into consideration as well, what mm. facts of biography influenced his decisions in the writing. And if you don't know those facts, you can't do that kind of analysis. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I'm writing the dissertation at Les Auburn, and if I put in any biographical detail whatsoever, they're going to kill me. So. Mm. Um, I probably have five or six questions, but, but, but I'll just, I'll, I'll swing back to something you guys said earlier. Um, Dungeons and Dragons, for example, is at its most popular um, phase that it's probably ever been in its lifetime. There are hmm. people who watch people play Dungeons and Dragons on Twitch. Um, whether or not you uh, like the ending, Game of Thrones was a huge event movie. And the spoilers uh, haven't watched them yet. Event, it was a huge event season for uh, uh, HBO. We have superhero movies, which are now mainstream. We have all of these other things which are now mainstream, which you can trace back to perhaps the success of Lord of the Rings and some other things like that, World of Warcraft, what have you. So I agree that, yes, at one point, having been the kid who had to hide his D20, yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, you know, the outlier and whatnot, but is that really the future, and what does that mean for Robert Howard? Uh, I think it's very important as we're now in this area of geek culture becoming mainstream mm -hmm. with all these mainstream superhero movies and fantasy movies. It's great. It's fantastic. We're having a great time. But the most important thing I think everybody will agree is it's not important to be a good superhero movie. It's not important to be a good fantasy television show. It's important to be a good movie, a good show, first and foremost. If you remember back to Conan the Barbarian, 1982, it wasn't a very Robert E. Howard show, mm -hmm. but it was damn entertaining. Mm -hmm. That was a great movie. That's mm -hmm. a fun movie. It Basil mm -hmm. Paul Doris gave the best score of his career in that yeah, movie. Yeah. And then they followed it up with Conan the Destroyer and Red Sonia. Yeah, you, know, you cannot form a franchise when you have that many flops in a short order. Um, but there's no reason why there can't be a big Conan resurgence, and there has been to a certain extent with 
all the work that has been going on with promoting Conan the last couple of years. The Marvel comics especially, I think, have done some really interesting things in the last few months just because they took a very different tack from how Dark Horse took it. Dark Horse was re-representing Conan the Barbarian almost from a chronological standpoint, born on the battlefield and going on from there, retelling Howard's original stories, which is all great, terrific. They did a great job of it. They did some original stuff, which is also fine. Marvel's doing it very differently. Uh, mm. Marvel's dropping him right into the universe as if he never left. There's a lot of references in the new stories to the old Marvel comics from back in the 1970s and 80s. Mm. Um, it's really fascinating how they're doing it because they don't need to tell the origin of Conan the Barbarian. And Robert E. Howard never need to tell that origin either. He just, Conan strides onto the page fully formed. Uh, do you guys agree with me on that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Does that answer your question? <laughs> Scott? Yeah, um, this is a statement or, or an observation I'm just curious if you guys agree with. One of the things with DeCamp and his biography is that he, he did research. I mean, he actually did research and interviewed people. And when, if you read that, you get the idea, wow, there's a lot behind this. Um, you know, it's kind of a definitive word on him. And my perception is because he did research and interviewed people, that it, it's taken you guys a lot of work to just, you know, debunk the myths because you had to go back and say, well, despite the research, we're coming to different conclusions. And to me, that's where all this work has come in because he actually did made an attempt to do a pretty good research biography. What do you think about that? Rob. Some of the footnotes that he includes lead to things that don't, in fact, have much to do with what he's talking about at the time. So it, it might have the appearance. But if you follow the footnote through, it hmm. doesn't quite make sense. You think about the weapons, or remember the Yatagan. Mm -hmm. and, and so there was this thing about Robert Howard's collection of weapons, so he had this and that and this and that, and then you have a footnote, so the average reader is not going to bother hmm. uh, reading the source of that, but if you go to the source, he mentions the Yatagan in the, in the course of his text, and you go to the footnote, and the Yatagan is a 19th century weapon, whatever, hmm. so he was referencing not the collection, but the weapon oh. itself. So. And I'm going to give another example, the Bob Howard was a sickly child thing. Mm -hmm. And the reference of that was an interview with Kate Merriman. And if you read the original interview, they asked her the question, I think, four or five times during the course of the interview. So he was a sick child, wasn't he? No, she, he wasn't. But he was a sick child, wasn't he? No, he wasn't. But he was a sick child, wasn't he? No, he wasn't. And you read The Dog Belly Destiny, he was a sick child, referenced Kate Merriman. So yes, he was doing the research, but he was doing what you wanted to do with the research, or when the Howards went to live to Bag in Bagwell in 1913-14. And so in 1914, they arrived, uh, the, the Howards arrived in Bagwell, which was a thriving community. And uh, the, the footnote to that, it doesn't tell you that the Howards arrived there, it tells you that Bagwell was a thriving community. I mean, it was always like that, it was trying to mislead you. So it's I don't know, even dishonest. Even with that, that appearance of being a research book, I think you guys have had to do a way more work to get underneath that. To, to undo all that. To undo yeah, all yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, because it has the appearance of, wow, exactly. I did a lot of stuff. And when you, when you try to undo something, it's very difficult because you have to do the actual research. But your mindset is, of course, if you have read Dark Valley Destiny or whatever before that, you tend to think that way. We all had this image of, he was a sickly child, except that it was, you know, or everyone in the, in the early family had That's TB, which not turns out was not the case. Yeah. No one in the family had tuberculosis, so. I, I, I have the impression that Sprig was, you know, ungodly bright. He was a brilliant man. Um, but but he, he had this preconceived notion and that's what he brought to it, and it gets to the point where, you know, you're you're finding what you're looking for rather than being entirely objective, and and that became what he was doing, and it it got past him and carried away with him. I I knew this is kind of an, a, a sidebar, but um, in the in the early in the mid 70s, I knew Edmund Hamilton and Lee Brackett, and they used to spend the the, the summer 
in Kinsman, Ohio, which is up the road from, this is farm country, this is up the road from where I was living with my parents. And um, so I started corresponding with them and I went up to visit them occasionally. So I probably visited with them five, six times. Met Yelp and Price there and they were wonderful people, you know. Um, and they, they knew the DeCamps and they thought highly of the DeCamps, you know. But, it, but um, I wonder now if, if a comment that Ed made to me is, is pertinent here because he asked me, we talked about writing and writers and childhood where ideas come from. And he said, did you have um, a pleasant childhood? I said, I had a great childhood. <laughs> I was out in the country, you know, me and Eric ran and played soldier. We did all this great stuff. And, and he, he, I said, my adolescence was not pleasant. I mean, you know. And he said, well, that's, I'm the same way. He said, I had a wonderful childhood, but you get into adolescence, and, you know, it's a very troubling period and everything. And he said, Sprague's working on the idea that, that great writers have troubling childhoods. And I've wondered ever since if, if that was, if he was working on a concept there and brought it into maybe Lovecraft and, and maybe Howard both, you know, um, and that he was working with that idea and that, and that seeped into to the way that he portrayed Howard. Um, so it's, I just throw that out there, you know. Um, because aside from, from what he says about Howard and even Lovecraft to some degree, I mean, the guy, the guy's a great writer. I mean, he wrote, you know, all this stuff. So it's kind of too bad, in a way, you know, the way I feel about it. It's like, damn it, why'd you do that? You yeah. Know? DeCamp <laughs> did uh, write about Lovecraft as a sickly child as well. You had a question mm -hmm. there. Um, I was going to ask this, but you kind of went into it. Do you think uh, he tried to manufacture that idea because everyone thinks like you said, intellectuals have to be like sickly kids or nerdy kids. And you think maybe that's why Howard is so different, because he was bodybuilding mm -hmm. to work on Conan, and he go and actually box to work on these things. He's mm -hmm. quite different to every other writer, really. Do you think that's why he's such an enigma, or do you think that's why, like you said, like nerd culture is so popular now, but mm -hmm. it's become its own thing where it will actually prejudice like oh you can't be a nerd because you're a bodybuilder yeah yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting it's, it's like interesting he's, he's on both sides of the tracks really huh do you think that's maybe why they had to create a, uh, an idea that people could i don't know that the camp was being malicious right uh i i, I feel like he had an idea uh, and yeah. it kind of took over where he was going yeah, maybe people couldn't understand a writer who wasn't. And I, I, I haven't yeah. read Time and Chance. Maybe Gary can comment on this, but I feel like uh, some of the com uh, things that occurred to DeCamp in his own life, he was finding mirrors in Robert E. Howard's and ascribing meaning to them that maybe weren't there. I think the questions you are asking at the moment are very indicative. We are supposed here to be talk talking about uh, we are writers oh, about our and yeah, all true. the conversations are about okay, El Sprague de Camp. My, <laughs> uh, my question, let's, let's steer it a little back towards Howard and towards the four of you. Um, why don't you all uh, explain how you found Robert E. Howard, just, it, it, just kind of a basic question, how you found Robert E. Howard and what was the, the, the story or the character that, that really grabbed you and made you a fan. So first, start out with what was your first exposure to Howard, and what's your favorite Howard? Uh, I discovered the French uh, translation of the Marvel comics, and I was buying everything Marvel, so I, I yeah, bought yeah, Savage yeah. Sword, and I hated that, but I was a Marvel zombie, so I bought the next one, and I liked <laughs> it. And then I started realizing that there was this Robert Howard guy names on, on the story, so I, I found a, a paperback, a French one. I don't remember to this day if I ever read the first, it was the first Conan, uh, the French one to the Lancers. I don't remember to this day if I read the Decam story first, but it left no impression on my mind whatsoever. And then I read Tower of the Elephant. And when I read Tower, I think, wow, who's this guy? Yeah. Yeah. And I was, I, I was cooked. <laughs> uh, I was 10 years old going through my dad's stack of old comic books and I got to Conan the Barbarian where he's doing the Tower of the Elephant. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can talk about any other writer, but what other writer could make you feel pity for an elephant-headed alien yeah. <laughs> yeah. who's trying to commit yeah. assisted suicide? You know, 10-year-old me was hooked. 
I um I I remember I was probably about ten. I was ten or eleven maybe, and a little four eyes. I was at the the eye doctor's and getting fitted for a new prescription, and I, I had an Edgar Rice. I, I don't know which Edgar Rice Burroughs novel it was a Tarzan novel or something. And and the the doctor who fit us for the glasses, he said, "You like you like Tarzan? Yeah, I do." So you have to find out about this character named Conan. He's he's like Tarzan only. He's really you know powerful, and there these are wicked stories or whatever. And in retrospect, I'm sure he's talking about the Gnome Press editions, which I you know, how am I going to find those when I'm 10 years old? And you know, um, but I remembered that when in 67, 68, there used to be a monster magazine called. Um, Castle of Frankenstein. If any of you remember it, yeah, it was the, it was just the coolest thing. It was just, the, you know, it was, he put everything in but the but the kitchen sink, and it was so cool. And Lynn Carter wrote book reviews for that. And here here comes Lynn Carter with I don't know Castle of Frankenstein number ten or nine or whatever it was, saying, you know, you can't keep a good man down. Conan the Barbarians is a great hero, you know, that Robert E. Howard wrote in the thirties, and now they're being reissued um, by Lancer Books. And I went, holy, that's that's what you know, Doctor So and So was telling me about. Went to the Gray Drug Store in Liberty Township, you know, Ohio, and there it was. And I started buying them and reading them. So that, and, and the, the first one I read, and it was Conan that started the whole thing. But um, I, was, I was short on time, so remember I, I skipped ahead, and the first one I read was um, Jewels of Gwalor, you know, was, was the title. And um, that, that scene where he's climbing up the, the, the face of that escarpment, that cliff, I remember that ever since. I mean, that's how vivid the guy, the guy wrote, so vividly. So. <laughs> the, the only difference I would I was I no, I don't remember if it was the comic books or the I did not buy the Lancers because I'm not that old. Yeah, I'm old for it. Mine was the Ace reprints of them, yeah. and they had numbers on the back on the spines: one, two, three, four, five, six, up oh, to yeah, twelve. Yeah. And I was a comic book collector from way back because my dad used to take me to the barber shop. The barber shop used to let me play with the comic books while my dad was getting his hair buzzed. So I saw these numbers on the spines of these books, and when you pull the first one out, the covers just jump out at you and yeah. grab you. Yeah. Uh, so I think I ended up buying probably the first four or five of them in one batch with my allowance. And I read Conan number one first. And in the A series, mm. the first story was The Frost Giant's Daughter. Oh. Done. <laughs> and then I started reading these other ones. I'm like, that mm. first story was really good. This one's not so hmm. good. Yeah. And you know, it was very hit and miss, and it was hard to tell the, who had written what. The derivative stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, mm. the Howard stories are great. And 30 years later, I was trying to find something that my high school students would read on their own. Oh, and I wow. went, well, what was I reading then? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. to Barnes and Noble I went, and the rest, of the, and now I'm here. <laughs> sounds to me like you guys owe more to Roy Thomas than to L. Sprague de Camp, as far as your love of Conan. I, I owe L. Sprague de Camp, I really do. I mean, I'm... I like I'm, his own writing. I like I, his I own agree. stories. And I, I memorized those introductions that he wrote, you know, to the Conan. I memorized the map and everything. Sam, I'm, I'm, I'm older than these guys, so, I, you know, I've never played Dungeons and Dragons, okay? Yeah, I mean, was, you know... That was late. Yeah, that was late. You know, I, I go back, you know, I was watching westerns and reading Conan paperbacks, you know. Sam, yeah. I'm older. Roy Thomas always made sure to name drop. Howard name every time he could, so he was the one, he said, oh, you should buy those stories because you could see the name Robert Howard written in the comic mm. book, so that was cool. Mm. In, in, in the old Savage Sword, you had all these articles which were really interesting. Yeah, that's true. Hmm. Hmm. A lot of the guys like Lovecraft and that took it to the late 70s and early 80s to kind of resurge in popularity. Why do you think uh, how it maintained a reasonably flat line of popularity. He didn't really. Uh, he did. He he didn't actually. Uh, hmm. Robert Howard is actually probably a generation or two behind Lovecraft. What happened is hmm. when Lovecraft died in 1937, uh, August Derleth and Donald oh, Wandry sure. founded Arkham House specifically to publish his stuff yeah. in hardback. Yeah. So Lovecraft was getting published in hardback in 1939. And Derleth continued to promote Lovecraft in anthologies and mm -hmm. weird tales all through the 1940s and into the 1950s. And then there was a boom in fantasy fiction in paperback. Mm -hmm. Paperback was a new thing because the pulps mm -hmm. had been dying out, especially with the paper shortages during World War II. And 
Uh, Nome Press got in in the 50s with the hardbacks for the Robert E. Howard stuff, mm -hmm. and Ellsbury DeCamp sort of inserted himself there at the end. And so at the time, you know, Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings, and it was published in paperback in 55 or 65? 65. 65. In paperback. In paperback. 65, 55 yeah, in hardback, 66, 65 yeah. in paperback. Mm -hmm. And that really started the paperback fantasy boom, and mm -hmm. Howard and Lovecraft both went off from that. But they mm -hmm. went off in different directions because Robert E. Howard got the very successful comic book series in Marvel Comics in 1970. Lovecraft didn't have as much success in comics, mm -hmm. but he had more promotion through Arkham House in anthologies and stuff. So they went off in different ways, but uh, Lovecraft Studies is actually older, so they've got like two decades a difference, and Ellsbury DeCamp did his Lovecraft biography long before he did the Robert E. Howard biography. Um, so yeah, it's sort of a false thing. We think, all right, Robert E. Howard's all over the place now, but it wasn't always the case. This was a long haul to get to this point where he's this prominent as a writer. You know, I'll, oh, I'm sorry. Arkham House published some of Howard's work? Yeah. Yes, he did. Uh, well, yeah. Three volumes. Uh, the first one was Skull Face and Others in 1946. And that was a big man of anthology. And then the second was the, the Poems, Always Comes Evening. And mm -hmm. that was thanks to Glenn Lord. And then the last one was The Dark Man in 1963. Yeah, the last one. Yeah. If I remember correctly, I was in college in the early 70s, and I'd already known about Howard, and there was a real Lovecraft push for you on the paperbacks and everything. And if I recall correctly, there was, there was quite a bit of European interest in Lovecraft at the time, and in scholarly publications and anthology and stuff. I don't think that was necessarily true of Howard at, at that time. Um, so Lovecraft got, kind of got a leg up in intellectual interest from the European press, you know, in France and in Italy and in some of those countries also. Um, yeah, that's the point I was going to make with that. I thought I had another thought, but I'm getting old. Yeah, in order to be popular in the States, you need to be famous in France <laughs> first. <laughs> so, yeah, working on it. How much time do we have? Ten minutes. Hmm? One or two more questions? So writing about popular culture um, figures, um, how do you balance um, you know, like the, the rigor that a scholar wants to uh, use with um, the fun of it? You know, if you ever think to yourself that you're going to alienate a reader that, you know, uh, by too much rigor, how do you stop doing that? Tell us about that. That's on me. Well, I, I think like Patrice said, it really depends on the audience. You have to write to the audience. Yeah, sure I am. It all depends on the audience. I mean, I can have some fun when writing for, you know, the, the afterwards, the Glenna graphic novels. So it's, it's light and funny and with, you know, another week here and there. Uh, well, at last open, it's not something I can do, obviously. I casually dropped in the reference to Star Wars and that was about it. <laughs> <laughs> and it was daring. So, did you have any thoughts? No. I, I, I like scholarly. I, I ended up working for almost 30 years as a medical editor. So, believe it or not, it got to be interesting editing surgical papers about cervical fractures and stuff and, and <laughs> working with the doctors on their styling and everything. And um, I've, I've, I've always picked up an academic book to read, you know, because it's interesting facts. And if the topic is interesting, and if the writer knows what, what he or she is doing, it's interesting to read. And it's, it's just as simple as that. It's not just dry, dry bones facts. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's always a kind of narrative there or a drama there that's going on. And so learning is fun, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. Not because the staff, the staff is fun that you're not allowed to write seriously about something, I think, anyway. I think we have time for one more question. Anybody? Interesting one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, far in the back. Yeah, for a, a short conversation this morning with someone else in the One of the things that they asked me was, do you think Howard's work today will be received, or that it will continue to be received and has been, or will it run into what Lovecraft scholarship, what Lovecraft fandoms run into, or is it, or is it a schism? In, in, in the fandom over 
we could say political correctness, or we could talk about the time of their writing. Is that something you think is in the future, perhaps? Is that something we're going to have to confront and deal with? Um. Robert E. Howard lived during the 1920s and 1930s. It was the nadir of race relations in the United States. Mm -hmm. He lived in a rural Texas town. He was racist. There's no way to get around that fact, and nobody has tried to downplay it in any of the serious academia. Um, I don't foresee a major schism in Howard's scholarship about that. I do think that it is something that has to continually be addressed going forward, but that's just as it is, you know, that's how he is, that's how he was, and uh, the Lovecraft schism you're talking about, that's, there's a lot of misinformation on there about that, um, which is sad considering how much has been written about Lovecraft, but I think you guys will agree with me that it's just something you have to address, and it's not something we like, it's not something we promote, it's not something that we say, oh yes, this is good, he was correct about this, because we don't. But it is what he wrote, and we would rather see the ugly truth mm -hmm. than try to pretend that Robert e. Howard or any of his fiction is different than what it is. But I don't think there's any letting the genie out of the bottle. I think that Robert e. Howard is continuing to be an exciting, interesting writer to a lot of people because people keep buying his work, people keep buying adaptations of his work, stuff based on his work, the games, uh, Films, movies, comic books. If you go onto Amazon, there's a thousand Kindle editions. Yeah, he's here to stay, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for one? Yeah, more? That's yeah. One. yeah. Yeah, that would be. No, you, yeah, you. Hello, sir. I'm the gentleman on the end. Yeah. Pigeons from Hell, that he wrote. Is that directly drawn from his experiences in Bagwell? And directly? Yes. No, no, um, no, it's inspired by some of the stories that uh, one of the helpers in the house told him. I don't so, know that I would say it was, you know, he didn't experience anything like that. You didn't find a house out there, did you, right? That's the one you in Bagwell? I've been there. Uh, I don't know where they stayed. I don't, couldn't find the house. Mm -hmm. But Bagwell's kind of creepy. Have you been there? Very creepy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. I ain't going to go to Bagwell. It sounds like a first hand experience. You know the way he describes a foyer and a house, of course, that's well, that's that's what I'm saying. When you can take, yeah. you can read it without any bio, uh, biographical information and still come away with things from the story. But when you know things, it adds that extra wrinkle. Yes. I mean, he was just a good writer, so he sure. could write about any any entrance to a house, and it'd be great. So. Well, thank you, everyone.